Welcome back, team chemistry coach, coming at you for colligative property number three. So we covered vapor pressure lowering. We covered boiling point elevation, which kind of is hopefully seems like a logical extension. So the freezing point depression isn't going to be a logical extension of vapor pressure lowering. But if you remember from the last video, if you watched the boiling point elevation, when we looked at the phase, how the phase diagram shifted from the pure solvent to that of the solution, uh, it caused the boiling point to get higher uh, and it caused the freezing point to be lower than that of the pure solvent. So the freezing point depresses. It's depressing, <laughs> All right? So the freezing point of a solution is always freezing point, melting point. Right? So the freezing point of a solution is always lower than that of the pure solvent. It is depressed. Why? So we'll look at it from a molecular point of view like we did with the other colligative properties. How is it that their particles of solute would cause the freezing point to be lower of the solution versus that of the pure solvent? It must impede the ability for that to happen, right? Uh, and then we'll look, I'll draw up that phase diagram shift again. So one of my shirts, I, I have a whole closet full of dorky shirts, right? So if you dissolve Prozac in water, will it depress the freezing point? <laughs> so sorry about that. Some of you are like going, let me think about that shirt for a little bit. Yes, I hope a whole, I have a whole closet full of these dorky things. And I think I've only bought one of them. People just hear, oh, Mickey, he's a chemistry professor. He'll like this. And I'm like, okay, I'll wear them for specific lectures. So let's take a look at two points of view. Let's look at the molecular point of view first. Shrink your brain. If I was a molecule floating around in this, you know, if I was water, a water molecule and all of a sudden all the solute dumped in, how would that impact my motion? How, it, wh how, does that, how does that change thing, right? And then we'll do that uh, phase diagram shift again real quick. Hang on. Ready for the molecular point of view? Very different from boiling point elevation and vapor pressure lowering, okay? So, well, I guess it kind of is similar to vapor pressure lowering. Let's take a look. So let's, here's two pictures, pure solvent and the solution, the solvent with some solute particles in it. All right, so let's take a look at the pure solvent and looking at this equilibrium between liquid and solid. So let's say we got some solid on the bottom and some of those can peel off, depends on temperature, things like that, right? But some of those in the red arrows can peel off and go into liquid phase and that will continue. And then some in the liquid phase can go bunk in the green arrows and hit the solid and be incorporated in the solid. So this will continue until you get an equal rate, right? So the rate of molecules leaving the cell or ions, if it's an ionic solid. Um, but hard to think about that in ionic liquid at this point. We're not going to go there. <laughs> so we're, we're not going to do uh, electrolytes for our solvents, okay? <laughs> so let's say we've got a solid. And if the number of molecules are peeling off in the liquid phase, if that's occurring at the same rate as the number of liquid molecules incorporating back into the solid, so the green arrows and red arrows are the same, then you have an equilibrium between the amount of molecules in the solid phase versus the liquid phase. Oh, it's all fine and dandy, right? But now, you know, and, you know, determined by it, that would determine its freezing point. What if we add these little brown particles in here, right? That's our solute, whatever that is. And that could be electrolyte, non-electrolyte, doesn't matter. We add those in there. Well, those get in the way. They're blocking the path. Right? Just like if they're here, they make it harder to vaporize, right? So it lowers the number of molecules in the vapor phase, the gas phase, so it you know reduces the vapor pressure, but it makes it harder for those liquid molecules to go to the solid, right? So if my hand's the solid and this molecule wants to go in there, but there's something in the way, right? It's pretty hard for it to incorporate into the solid. <laughs> so it reduces the rate of liquid molecules going to the solid, right? So if you add solute particles, it decreases the rate of the liquid to solid transition. So you might have more peeling out the solid going into the liquid phase and fewer going from the liquid phase to the solid phase. So more red arrows than green arrows. Uh-oh, disrupted the equilibrium. Not good, it's not happy. So to reestablish equilibrium, something has to change, right? So to reestablish the rate of molecules peeling from the solid to the liquid, that rate has to go down and the liquid back to the solid would need to go up or a combination of two. So what happens? If the temperature is decreased, freezing point depression, right? If you lower the temperature, a couple things happen. One, 
you are decreasing the solid to liquid transition rate. So you're reducing that rate, right? And, and so hopefully until it equals the liquid to solid rate when those two rates are the same. And you're reducing the kinetic energy or the thermal motion of those liquid particles, which means if they're moving slower, if they hit the solid, they're more likely to incorporate, form those intermolecular forces and incorporate into the solid phase. So by lowering the temperature and the combination of, of decreasing the solid liquid to trans solid to liquid transition and reducing the thermal or kinetic energy of those liquid molecules so they incorporate more readily into the solid phase, you can get back to equilibrium. Okay, but that occurs at a lower temperature. So the freezing point of the solution is depressed. It will be lower than the freezing point of the pure solvent. A little bit harder for me to understand than the boiling point elevation one, but there you go. Let's draw that phase diagram shift again. Some of you may look at that and go, that makes more sense. Both ways. I want you to think both ways. All right, remember the phase, the phase diagram drawing we did on the last video, so I'm going to go a lot quicker on this one. But let's say we have some solvent, some pure liquid, right? Could be water, could be whatever. Uh, and this would be the phase diagram. So we're looking at the gas phase here, liquid phase there, and solid phase there. Triple point, critical point, supercritical fluids up there. And if you take a look at just for example, you could pick any pressure, let's just say one atmosphere, go across where it connects to the fusion curve. That comes down to the normal melting point. That would be the for the pure liquid or pure solvent. Go across to the vapor pressure curve, come down, that's where the normal boiling point would be. If that was water, it'd be zero degrees Celsius, 100 degrees Celsius, right? It's not drawn to scale. That's for the pure solvent. But if we add solute particles, regardless of their identity, colligative property, right? Create an ideal solution, ideal mixture. That's going to shift it. So let's do that in green. That shifts the whole thing down. So you get a new fusion curve. You get a new triple point. New vapor pressure curve. That's a pretty horrible line I drew there. And so this green one would be for the in the solution. So that would be for that solvent now in the presence of solute particles. So it shifts that whole phase diagram down. And we looked before on the last one, notice if you go across, you go here and come down. I'll do that in blue. You have an elevated boiling point, right? The, the boiling point has increased. And this difference right here is your delta T B. That's your boiling point elevation, right? We looked at that in the last video. I mentioned freezing point depression. Freezing point depression. Right? So that happens here. So if we go across, we connect with the new fusion curve here. Come down. Boop and you have a decreased melting point or freezing point. You could think of that as the normal melting point or freezing point. Steam temperature. And so now we have this difference here. That's your delta T F. The freezing point of the solution is less than that of the pure solvent. The boiling point of the solution is higher than that of the pure solvent. So the addition of the solute, remember, extends the liquid range. So if it was water, instead of freezing between at zero and boiling at 100, so having a liquid phase existing between zero and 100, it extends it. So it may range from negative 5 degrees Celsius to 105 degrees Celsius, right? It extends the ex existence of the liquid, which is necessary. Like I said, if you live in Southern California, it's really hot, right? You want to elevate the uh, boiling point of your mixture with your antifreeze. And if you're in Minnesota, like I grew up as a kid, you need the antifreeze because you don't want pure water in your radiator freezing at 0 degrees Celsius. You want it depressed, right? So I forget. I don't have my glasses on again. So this freezing point of this uh, antifreeze solution is negative 34 degrees Fahrenheit, and it says negative 37 degrees Celsius. Just I can barely read that, so don't quote me on that. I don't have my, my old man eyeballs, uh, glasses on. So that's kind of important. I mean, I've has it gotten colder than negative 34 degrees Fahrenheit in Minnesota? 
I've felt that with the wind chill factor less than that. That's highly unpleasant, but it's unlikely that the liquid is going to freeze in your radiator overnight. That'd <laughs> be a real bummer, especially if it expanded and cracked your radiator. Okay, so that's really, really critical. Another thing when I was a kid growing up in Minnesota that I didn't see in, in, when I moved to California was a lot of the cars, right? Late 60s, early 70s, mid 70s. Um, you know, the old good old, uh, you know, muscle car, 69 Camaro, baby, yeah! They would have uh, rust along the bottom where the wheels are, right, the bottom there, and uh, kind of, and you would see pieces of metal flaking off and holes forming. A lot of people had that, right? I don't remember people driving nice cars over there. Uh, so you drive all these big old beasts, you know, getting seven miles a gallon or whatever, and they're all rusted and pitted at the bottom. I think, I don't know if sure off the top of my head, but I think it's because they would try to, they would de-ice the roads. I remember I'd see these trucks that would go down the street after the snow plows and stuff. But, you know, you ever been driving and hit black ice or something or ice? You're like, Phew. I did that one time. I was going through, didn't see the black ice. There was a stop sign, hit my brake, didn't even see it, right? And whoop, I just started doing 360s all the way through the stop sign, all the way across the intersection. I was like, whoo, and I... Just ended up going forward, one of my nine lives. I'm like, phew, nobody was there. I mean, can you imagine? But I was like, boom, 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 doing three. I did that another time coming off a freeway off ramp, um, hit black ice, started spinning like that, coming off a freeway, and I ended up missing the guardrails by like an, an inch or two. You just you just sit there and just go, oh, there was another one of my nine lives. Yikes. So it'd be nice to get rid of that. So what they, I would see these trucks go by spraying out this slushy mix. I don't, I didn't know what it was, but, and I still don't know what it was, but imagine you take some sodium chloride or something, mix it with some water and create this and spray it out there. Well, now the water's not going to freeze at zero degrees Celsius anymore. It's going to freeze it lower. So maybe it goes down to like negative five, negative six, negative seven degrees Celsius. And so that black ice now goes bye-bye and you just have this slushy, mess so so it, it makes it so there, there's less slipping and sliding you know it's kind of fun actually if there's nowhere the cars to run into but you can see the purpose of that but all that salt that was put in there i think that was what was causing the rusting uh of the bottoms of the cars pretty crazy all right let me show you an equation we'll do some math my friends here we go gonna go about twice as fast on this because it parallels the boiling point elevation almost identically, right? Few minor changes. So the freezing point depression, how much does the freezing point go from the pure solvent to the solution? And it goes down, right? That's gonna be delta T sub F instead of delta T sub B for boiling point elevation. So that's the final state, the temperature freezing point of the solution minus the initial state, the freezing point of the pure solvent. Now remember, the solution is gonna be lower, the freezing point of the solution is lower than that of the solvent. So this is negative, right? You're taking a, a smaller number minus a bigger number, so that should be negative. For the boiling point elevation, this was higher, that was lower, so that always had to be positive. So we're gonna have to account for this negative sign, blah, so you see a negative sign appear in the equation right there, right? Just like boiling point elevation, this depends on the amount of solute, the molality of the solution, right? Uh, the Van Hoff factor depends if the solute is an electrolyte or not, like sodium chloride, etc. And then the we have the boiling point elevation constant for the other one. This will be the freezing point depression constant, again, in degrees Celsius per molal. And you can find those on tables, right? So like my table, I, just, I have the solvent. If you're doing a boiling point one, there's the boiling point of the pure solvent and the boiling point depression constant. Here's the freezing point of the pure solvent and the freezing point depression constant in degrees Celsius per mole. Depending what table you look at, you'll have a smaller table probably in your textbook, maybe three, four, five very common solvents. Uh, water, of course, would be by far the most common one that we use. All right, so here's our equation. So the boiling, the uh, freezing point depression, the amount that it goes down, you saw that shift on the phase diagram, will be the Van Hoff factor times the freezing point depression constant times the molality. Exactly like the boiling point elevation, you just have an F instead of a B. And that dreaded negative sign. Why is that negative sign there? Well, because I is always positive. K sub F is positive. How can you have a negative concentration? That makes no sense. Since all of those are always positive, and that has to be negative, there must be a negative sign in here. So that's another, that, that sign is necessary for that to happen. So same idea, you can have two types, I'm not going to rewrite this, two types of problems like I did. Watch the boiling point elevation video. You could have one type where I give you information on the solvent and the solute, 
and then you have to calculate the molality and then figure out what the uh, freezing point depression was or the freezing point of the solution, right? So given information on solute and solvent, calculate the freezing point of the resulting mixture or the amount that it decreases. I usually have to calculate that. So that's the first type. When we did that in the boiling point elevation constant video, let's do the other one for this one, where in this situation, I give you the amount that the freezing point depressed or I give you the freezing point of the pure solvent and the freezing point of the resulting solution and say, hey, in order to get this particular freezing point, so say like we're in Minnesota and I want, I don't want the roads freezing at zero degrees Celsius, like pure water, I want them freezing at say negative three, negative four, negative five degrees Celsius. Okay. How much salt, say sodium chloride or whatever it is, or cabbage juice or whatever you want to use, right? I think I read an article where they're trying to use cabbage juice, a little more environmentally friendly, spraying out this kind of purpley thing. I like cabbage on my salad, so I don't know about you. I, I love I love the crispiness of it. It makes the salad nicer, put the croutons in the sunflower seeds. But anyway, I must be hungry. It must be lunchtime. Um, how much of that solute would we need to add to a particular amount provided of solvent in order to achieve a provided freezing point? Right? That's the other kind of problem. So we'll do that kind of problem here. So we're going to solve for molality given everything else and then for molality we can get the moles of solute and from there the grams of the solute typically or if it's a liquid and we got the density we could get the volume of liquid necessary so there we go so van Hoff factor you have to be able to do in your head uh freezing point depression constants either provided for you or you can look it up on a table we're off to the races let's do a problem Here's a type of problem you may run into on a quiz or exam. Maybe even this exact one, just to see if you watch the video. Oh, okay. What mass of sodium chloride is required to add to 150.0 grams of water? So we know our solvent identity. And I could have picked any solvent I want. We know our solute identity. We're making an assumption this is an ideal mixture, right? We're an ideal solution. We good? We good? We're always making that assumption. Otherwise, this wouldn't work real well. To provide a freezing point of negative 3.00 degrees Celsius. We don't want our roads freezing at zero degrees Celsius. We want them freezing lower than that. So we're not doing the old 360s through the stop sign or 360s off the side of the freeway like I did. Used up two. I used another one of my nine lies uh, coming through the mountains at night. Uh, I was going fast, man, because uh, the the five freeway had flooded. I was coming driving from Washington to uh, California, and I was going through this. I had to take this little mountain bypass. I was in a hurry, so I was cruising through. It was at night, going up and down and around, and it's pitch black. And at the bottom, and this semi was right on my tail. Oh, my gosh. I mean, I, I'm like, dude, you know, you know, go faster. He'd go faster. I'm like, yeah, he must have been in a hurry, too. I'm like, I'm uncomfortable. I'm like in my little Toyota Tercel. <laughs> and I came over this small little hill and came down, and it had flooded. Flooded, right so it was like a hill came down another hill and flooded here so I went Ooh, and I hit that full speed I must I don't know how fast I was going 65 70 something and I went boom and my car just went and I remember my car flipping up this way and I was skidding across on the nose of my car with a semi coming full speed behind me I'm like skidded across whoop came back down kept going there was another one of my nine lives, and I think I had a myocardial infarction. <laughs> Is that what you medical people call a heart attack? Myocardial infarction? Just call it a heart attack. Okay, anyway, I got distracted. So what are we going to do? This is a flip-flop. In the boiling point elevation constant, we had to solve for that ultimate temperature, but I was given this time. So here we go. Let's use the boiling, the, oops, this is not a boiling point problem. This is a freezing point problem. I have my freezing point shirt on. So use the equation for freezing point depression that I provide for you to determine the molality of the solution needed, the sodium chloride solution necessary. Once you have the molality, we can use that as a conversion factor to convert. Remember, that's moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. So we can use the molality as a conversion factor to take, to take the provided amount of solvent Use the molality to convert it to the amount of solute needed. In this case, mass. It doesn't specify units, so just do it with whatever units we end up with, probably grams, but you could convert it to pounds or something if you needed to, right? So molality will be used as a conversion factor. That'll be step one. Step two, convert solvent amount to solute amount using molality. 
Give it a shot. See what you can do. See if you can determine the Van Hoff factor for sodium chloride. Assuming that's it. Let's assume that's exact, even though, you know, thanks to Arrhenius and, you know, all these people, <laughs> it's not quite there. Um, but let's, accept, let's assume the Van Hoff factor is exact. Uh, look up the freezing point depression constant for water on your table, right? Or my table if you're in my class. Probably find that on my website. Uh, and then use that equation to solve for the molality, and then do a dimensional analysis problem, unit conversion, to figure to get it to grams of sodium chloride. See if you can do it. I'll erase this board, and we'll at least do the first step together. Here we go. I put kind of a basic outline of what we need to do to figure out the molality, right? Uh, so first, and this is our equation, right? So the freezing point depression will be negative Van Hoff factor times the freezing point depression. Constant times the molality. So we need those three. So we should be able to get the freezing point depression. I gave you the freezing point of the resulting solution, right? The mixture, right? Assuming it's ideal. You should know the freezing point of pure water. So if the freezing point depression is the solution freezing point minus the pure solvent freezing point, well, that would be negative 3.00 degrees Celsius provided for you of the resulting sodium chloride water ideal mixture. Subtract zero degrees Celsius, which is by definition exactly zero degrees Celsius for water. Well, that you could probably do that in your head. So the freezing point depression would be negative 3.00 degrees Celsius. That's always going to be negative, right? Boiling point elevation is always positive. It's going up. Freezing point depression is always negative. It's going down. All right. Well, let's look at our solute, sodium chloride. Right. Well, that's a strong electrolyte, so that's going to split up. So one mole of that would provide me one mole of sodium cations and one mole of chloride anions. Well, that one mole of that gives me two moles of particles. Uh-oh, we need to account for that. I equals two. And we're going to assume that's exact in my class, okay? Not true in real life, okay? It's probably a 1.94 or something. So we're slopping it here, assuming that's exact. Realistically, that should limit us to probably one or two significant figures. Uh, we'll see how the sig figs end up at the end um, and uh, play with that, right? But that's going to really limit the accuracy of this. What's the freezing point depression constant for water? All right, well, look at your look in your textbook or something. So here's water on the bottom of mine. That's the boiling point. We don't want that. So freezing point, zero degrees Celsius. Freezing point depression constant. What's that say? I don't have my glasses. 1.86 degrees Celsius per molal. Yeah, 1.86. And if it was a different solvent, you'd just use that freezing point and that freezing point depression constant. Hey, so you can manipulate things by using different solvents and you'll get dramatically different if you want it to go down even more, right? You can use something that has a different freezing point depression constant or something with a different Van Hoff factor. Right, right, right. So that will be, oh my gosh, I totally did not remember what I just said. Well, 1.86. <laughs> so that's 1.86 degrees Celsius per molal. Or you could go degrees Celsius times molal to the negative one. All right, we have this. We have this. We have this. Let's solve for that. Don't forget your negative sign because you'll end up with a negative molality and ultimately with a negative mass of sodium chloride. I need negative 3.28 grams of sodium chloride. What does that even mean? <laughs> right? So when you're like, happens in thermodynamics, you're like, this just doesn't make sense. I ended up with a negative volume. What? You screwed up the negative sign. All right, let's do some basic algebra to solve for molality. So that'll be the freezing point depression. Divided by the Van Hoff factor, divided by the freezing point depression constant. And let's bring that negative sign over, right? So bring the negative sign over. Here we go. So that will be negative of negative 3.00 degrees Celsius. Right tail. Yes. So the negatives cancel out. Whew, we needed that. I, we're assuming, is 2, right? So let's put a 2 here. And this will be Kf is 1.86 degree. This would be nicer if I set it up as a unit line equation. You could do it mathematically, but watch this. I'll put my Van Hoff factor here. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to use dimensional analysis because I've got units in the numerator, denominator. Uh, I'm going to set that up real nice to see how they cancel out. 
So this would be, dividing by that would be 1.86 degrees Celsius per molal. See how I set that up as a unit line equation? So I can see how the degree Celsius cancels out and I end up with molality units in the numerator. If I'd done it down there, you got to, okay, I got a denominator, the denom denominator becomes a numerator. It's a big pain in the butt, right? Um, you know, either way it works out, but we'll get an answer in molality here. Uh, if we're assuming that's exact, three sig figs there, three sig figs there, that's going to give us three significant digits. Let's punch this out. So negatives cancel out, so 3 divided by 2. Remember, if you don't use the Van Hoff factor, you'd be off by factor 2, and that happened to Van Hoff. He's like, well, what's going on here? Uh, divided by 1.86, you get a 0 0.80645. So 0 0.806. Vertical dash line, 3 sig figs, uh, 4, 5. And that'll be units of molal, right? Oh, my goodness. I don't have room for my units here. Well, let's put molal there. Boop. Or you could do, go um, moles of solute per kilogram of solvent in that case. But we'll, we'll split that up later in a second. So that's step one. We've just determined the molality of the solution necessary. So from this, we can use that as a conversion factor to convert the amount of water that was provided. Uh, and convert that to the amount of solute necessary. So let's do step two. All right, you ready for step two? This is where I lose most of the students. We want the mass of the sodium chloride needed, the solute in this case. We know the molality, 0.80645 molality. Let's write that out though. That would be 0.80645, good to three sig figs, moles of solute or moles of sodium chloride per kilogram of solvent or kilogram of water. So I've identified things. That's a conversion factor between water, the solvent, and sodium chloride, the solute. See that? So what we're going to do, we were given, I think it was 150.0 grams of water, right? So how much sodium chloride will we need to add to 150 grams of water to get a freezing point of negative 3.00 degrees Celsius? Well, take the grams of water, convert it to kilograms of water, and then we can use this to convert from kilograms of water to moles of sodium chloride. The molality is a conversion factor. And once you got moles of sodium chloride, just use the molar mass to go to grams of sodium chloride. Oh, so here's your starting point. Start with that 150.0 grams of water. I want you to pause this, convert that to kilograms. Use a nice dimensional analysis, convert to kilograms of water. Use the molality that goes moles of sodium chloride. Take my periodic table to get the molar mass of sodium chloride. Have at it. Let's see if we end up with the same thing. Did you get 7.07 .07 grams of sodium chloride? So let's take our 150.0 grams of water, 1,000 grams of water per kilogram, right? So we can cancel out our units here. Boop, boop. So now we're in the correct units in the molality. So we can take kilograms of water. There's 0 0.80645 moles of sodium chloride for every kilogram of water, right? So that's the molality. We just got rid of solvent units, right? Now we got to get from moles of sodium chloride to grams, so multiply by the molar mass. So take the sodium from your periodic table. So sodium on mine is, I don't know if I can read that, 22.989770. That's a lot of decimal places. Chlorine, 35.4527. Ooh, so the chlorine limits us to the four decimal places based on my periodic table. Ho, 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 ho. Make sure if you're in my class, you print that out. All right, if you're not in my class, you're crazy watching this stuff. What are you watching my video for? <laughs> Hopefully it helps you, but use whatever periodic table your instructors provided you, right? Whatever your, whoever your coach is at the time, use the one they're providing you. Uh, and that allows me to cancel out moles, leaving me grams of sodium chloride, right? Beautiful dimensional analysis we learned usually in the first week of class. I got four significant figures here. I got that's exact metric conversions. I got three in my molality and four, five, six here. So I end up with 7.0696 grams of sodium chloride. Good to three sig figs, rounds up to 7.07. .07. But in reality, because of the Van Hoff factor, um, that's probably more than we pr would normally go unless we had an accurate value of the Van Hoff factor provided for us. But um, in reality, that probably is not as accurate as we would like. 
There's freezing point depression for you guys. We only got one more collingative property to go. My biology and biochemistry friends, comfort zone, osmosis later. Yay.